My name is Leanne Hanley. Welcome to this recording on innovative practice in career guidance and coaching. And you'll see there Catherine Jenick is going to join me partly part way through the recording and introduce some practical ideas to illustrate what we're talking about. So the, what we're going to cover, first of all, what is innovative and uh, some of the key concepts, some of the modern advanced concepts that underpin uh, practice and some developments in neuroscience because when we talk about innovation it means that things are cutting edge, they're original, they reflect the most recent research and practice and so I'll run through those in advance just to lay the foundations for what Catherine's going to talk about because she's then going to go through some of the practical ideas that she uses with her clients. Okay so let's kick off with some of those key concepts. As I said they need to be when we talk about innovative, they need to be the most modern concepts. Um, and so one of the first concepts we're going to tackle is that of career, the word that's at the very heart of our practice. Now, you might like to take a little bit of time over this, you can pause it. But to think about, when you look at these pictures, and they are just prompts, which image, image best captures the word career for you? And it's important that I don't put my interpretation of those images onto you uh, because you might see different things uh, from what I see. But there's a classic image there of a ladder and if we look at um, some of the more traditional definitions of career, that's what career was taken to mean. It was to do with paid work and it was very linear, you'd start at the bottom and you'd work your way up. More modern definitions are wider than paid work, so we then have one by David Andrews which says, well, actually it's about learning and work, and that could be informal learning, informal work, it's about how we participate and how we contribute in the world, how we're occupied, if you like. And so we move on, away from the ladder, interestingly, to a very modern concept, that of crazy paving, that the fact that careers aren't so linear, um, but that you actually have to take them step by step, you can't plan ahead and you see where it leads. In hindsight, you might actually be able to see the pattern, but in the beginning, you don't quite know how things are going to unfold. And that's more of a metaphor, so I'm going to go through some official definitions, some um, formal definitions that reflect that more modern concept. Vucca. I'm not quite sure whether you've come across that concept before. It comes from the world of business and leadership. But um, it's an acronym for the conditions, and it can be any general conditions, but here we're taking it to, to mean the employment market, the education market, that landscape that our clients face. But it's increasingly volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And for some people, um, that's not necessarily the case. There are still those sort of ladders. Um, but for other people, it's much more scaffolding, crazy paving. Uh, they might have to move sideways, upwards, downwards, take a break. And, and also, the implications for uh, a, a landscape that's increasingly like that um, is this split between those people who have quite uh, secure jobs with secure conditions and those who are in a more precarious situation, the precariat. Now we can't sort of make that into a homogenous group because actually it's characterised by some people like myself who are freelance and I've chosen to do that. Uh, for other people, they haven't chosen it and they find themselves in a very precarious situation, casual contracts, zero hours, low pay, um, and they wouldn't have chosen it. So within that precariat there are numerous people, but all of whom are faced by this more volatile world. Great book on this is Charles Handy, The Elephant and the Flea, and seeing that actually we're more like fleas now that have to hop from these large organisations from one to another and adapt uh, to new situations. So we can't just sit comfortably on one elephant for all of our life, we have to hop around. So that's sort of the modern career, and so if you take the work of Arthur and Rousseau, they came up with this definition of the boundaryless career. So it's characterised by improvisation. You can't necessarily look ahead. Uh, you're going to have to be flexible, adapt, um, uh, downshift, move sideways. So that scaffolding or framework rather than a, than a ladder that has clear progression. Oops. There's quite a few definitions around like this. There's the, the um, protean career, uh, which again is about anticipating changes, building your skills, 
and then seizing opportunities and adapting. Um, but you can see this is very, very different from the ladder or the escalator uh, which you just get on and it almost takes care of you and there's very clear pathways. So there's a challenge here. We find that actually um, our clients need what we call now, instead of career planning, career management. Now within that, you still need the ability to plan, um, but actually our work now is not so much concerned with making the right occupational choice, because you can question whether that is actually feasible, it might be for some people, um, and it's much more sort of short term, you might have a long term broad vision, uh, but you actually have to keep it quite flexible. So your short term step is what matters and making sure the doors are kept open. Uh, and also though, in, in line with that, what we need is the, the to equip our clients with these career management knowledge, skills and attitudes, or KSA, um, to continuously face those choices and navigate that much more complex pathway. And I've just given you a few references there if you're interested in looking up career management. I mean, this quote is from the Canadian blueprint for life work design, but you've got the Australian blueprint, skills development, Scotland's career management skills framework, the English blueprint for careers. Worth looking at because actually they should familiarise yourself with the sort of research into what people need in order to navigate that, that complexity. So I've already just mentioned this shift, this shift from career planning to career management. Um, planning uh, reflect the sort of traditional notions of career, traditional career theory, which is very rational and linear. Um, characterized and practiced by a job match between your skills, qualities and interests and the occupations that are out there. Uh, information on short term and long term routes and options and then job search skills, CVs, uh, etc. So we still need all of those. We're not sort of putting those down, but it's not enough in today's landscape. Career management will still have job search skills, research skills, the ability to reflect on self and research opportunities, but it has other things that are required, other qualities um, and competencies, such as resilience. Not so much being knowledgeable, but being able to make sense of all the information that is out there, to, to also work out what's reliable and what's not. Um, curiosity, being open-minded, adaptability, courage, a whole array of career management competencies. I've kind of summarised them here, and as I said, have a look at the blueprints, but you can see the traditional careers work tended to focus on probably knowledge of self and what's available, um, with a few uh, skills in terms of um, job search and action planning, um, but it's wider than that, so you can notice there's much more emphasis on the the aptitudes and be able to take risks, step outside your comfort zone. And so it, it brings us towards the purpose of what we're doing. Um, is it just to get a plan in place? Problem with that is plans change, things happen, the world's volatile, uh, and we can't guess all the jobs that are going to be available long term. Um, or is it to develop career management skills that can be used again and again? And as I said, that includes coming up with plans, but being able to change them, adapt them, uh, and stay open-minded to the broad destination. Okay, a few key concepts. Um, these inform what take place in a one-to-one -one session. Most people don't understand uh, what actually, if we talk about career guidance as a term, for example, people think it's traditional matching. Um, actually, if we're talking about modern practice, and Career, I'll explain the difference between career guidance and coaching in a moment. Uh, but what takes place, um, and indeed what Kathleen is going to talk about, is actually how we explore and provide feedback on career management strengths and needs. Right? So how do we understand that story, not just what's their plan, but actually explore their story in terms of um, a broader career management story. Uh, we need to develop a relationship so that the client can be challenged about these blind spots. If we're not just giving information, but might be challenging about attitudes, how do we do that? Um, so that's another sort of uh, shift in practice. I mean, challenging has been at the heart of our practice for many years, but quite often it's a challenging of a plan. Um, challenging attitudes can be trickier. Um, all of it has to be gentle and constructive, positive, and held within a relationship of trust. 
Um, hence, they're the kind of things that a web-based program would struggle to achieve, and why everything can't be on the web. And then using a range of tools and techniques uh, to develop career management competencies. And again, Catherine will talk about some of the ones that she uses. As I said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between um, coaching and guidance. Um, classically, guidance, I think, is a difficult term. Uh, people think it's about guiding people. Actually, if you look at the OEC, uh, OECD definition, it's actually an umbrella term for an awful lot of what can take place on the continuum between being directive and non-directive. Sometimes we do need to be directive. Actually, people need to know the dates. Um, they need to be shown what to do um, when it comes to some of the basics and deadlines. Uh, if you're working with somebody who um, has autism, you might need to be more literal. Um, at the other end is the non-directive, much more counselling and coaching approach. And indeed, you know that is ideal because what we're trying to do it's all about learning. We're trying to equip our clients to learn and grow. And it's best to come to their own answers rather than us imposing on them. Um, but, you know, so if we take guidance, it's actually a very broad term which encompasses all of those. Sometimes we might be giving advice and information. Sometimes we might be coaching using counselling skills, but not actually counselling as in the sort of um, the, the pure counselling sense. OK, so I'm hoping that's clear. So Catherine's going to be talking through some of the methods that actually enable clients to reflect in, and asking questions that stimulate their thinking, but quite a deep thinking. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is where we're up to. We've done some of the key concepts very, very quickly. I know I haven't done them justice. And also, I'm not going to do justice to what I'm going to say now about um, developments in neuroscience, because um, we do understand an awful lot more about how the brain works, but there's probably still an awful lot more to understand. So I'm going to do some very sort of basics, um, because a lot of what Catherine's going to talk about is very creative. Um, and so we need to understand where does that fit in terms of career work. OK, this is quite a, uh, I think it's 1970s concept, the idea of the triune brain. And so some of you might be familiar with it. Uh, it's at the heart of what, what we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, the neocortex, the outside of the brain, is that very rational part of the brain, very logical, stored in words. The limbic system is much more experiential and you know made up of our senses, what we see, what we smell, what we touch, and automatic in terms of how we make decisions, very quick decision-making process. And then we have the reptilian complex, that part of the brain which is to do with fight fright or freeze, freeze, sorry. And of course, when that bit of the brain is triggered, we can't think rationally um, because all the blood goes from the rest of our brain. So when our clients are in flight, fright or freeze mode, then actually there's no point in asking them quite difficult, complex questions. So what we're going to talk about here is a whole brain approach. The triune brain as a concept was, was criticised in its, the original model because the um, it was seen as, as evolutionary linear in its development, and so the neocortex was seen as sort of um, a more advanced uh, way of thinking from the limbic system. But actually, that's kind of been debunked now. So we still have the triune brain, but what we have is the idea that these two parts of the brain, the rational and the automatic or intuitive, actually have to work together. They both have their advantages and their limitations. So if you have a look, um, I mean, you might want to pause and read this through, so I'm not going to read it through. But actually, system two is that rational analysis. It's quite limited in terms of the amount of information it can process um, at the same time. And therefore, it's not that great for complex decision-making um, that has to so many factors to take into account. System one is quicker, it's more intuitive, um, can process thousands of pieces of information, but can be prone to bias. Okay, so they both have their the limitations. So in terms of career decision making, it's interesting because most of our models tend to be around the rational uh, approach, uh, the system two. And actually, as I said, it's not great for complex life decisions. Most of our decision making is taking place in that limbic system, that automatic part of the brain. So what we need to do is to use method to actually engage both that actually engage the feelings, the creativity, the experiential learning, 
use images, smells, tastes, physical kinesthetic methods, and enable the client to reflect uh, and to bring them together. And there's some references if you want to know a little bit more about that theory. I mean, of course, I'm going to say actually, uh, myself and a colleague, uh, Kira Pompey, have a book coming out that goes through and some of what some things that Catherine's going to be talking about and the background to them. But there's a whole range of uh, references there for you. Okay, so implications. First of all, people can learn new ways of thinking and acting, but we have to use the whole brain. Actually giving them facts, um, telling them they should or they ought, and using logic is not going to create shifts in thinking. Okay, so that's one of the main things. It's also not going to motivate people. Um, again, people might know they ought to or they should, but they experience ambivalence. They know they ought to, they should, but part of them doesn't want to either. So that's why we need the whole brain to be used. And so creative methods um, are using things like visualization. That gets into the limbic part of the brain, using pictures, images. Metaphor is a brilliant method that crosses both the limbic and the cortex. So you're using words, but inherent in them are um, those sort of pictorial um, the images in the client's in brain, but also um, being able to get the client to change aspects of the metaphor so that actually some shifts take place at a deep level. Three chair work, perceptual positioning chairs, so actually getting clients to can do with chairs or bits of the room, but where people stand or sit in different places and occupy different perspectives. And something called backward action planning, which is using what in sports psychology, which is imagining reaching your goal, feeling it, and then looking backwards to see how you got there. I've missed out intuitive decision making. Um, that's a, a method, a step by step method of accessing the sort of gut feelings, but reflecting on what they're about. So there's a creative method, a very quick whistle stop tour. What I want to do is uh, I'm going to pause here for a moment and let Catherine come in. And she obviously works in the career development field. I'm going to ask a little bit about her background and to explain some of the methods. So if you just bear with me whilst I. Right, so welcome to Catherine, and Hello. thank you. It's just popped in <laughs> to my side, as I said. So, um, so Catherine, uh, would you like to start by saying a little bit about yourself, yep. you know, your background, your training? Yeah, so I've been a careers advisor for about 12, 13 years, I think. Um, so I didn't go the sort of traditional route of uh, DIPCG University into being a careers advisor. I've done a lot of learning as I've gone along, which for me has really worked. Mm -hmm. um, so I did the MVQ4, the initials LDSS, I can't remember the exact um, title, but that I did um, many, many years ago. And then more recently, about three or four years ago, I did the level six. Um, and I found that actually working whilst learning has been um, really useful for me because it's kept me very fresh and up to date with what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always felt quite lucky actually to be involved in so much great training as I've been working. Um, so yeah, so I initially worked for what was Connections in the UK, um, that was the career service, the name of it back then, that then became something called Futures um, and I now work as a freelance career advisor for a company called Ideas for Careers based in Nottingham and um, I work with the youngest is what we would call a year seven, so that's about 13, um, generally up to sort of 16 to 18 year olds. Um, mm. I have worked with young adults before, up to the age of 24, but currently it's mainly um, sort of 13 to 18. Mm. So the main things coming out there means for the year olds in the UK, you can go the, the university route, yeah. the work based route, if the uni work based yeah. route seems to work yeah. really well. Yeah. Um, and you work with a variety of clients, but with lots of young people. Yeah, I mean, I've worked with specialist groups in the past. I've worked with lots of teenage parents, asylum yeah. seekers, um, quite difficult inner city schools. Yeah. I've also worked in six forms and like I said, young, young adults as well. So lots of different types of people. Great. So one of the questions I'm going to uh, sort of come to later on is how you adapt some of your methods for, yeah. as a client group. Yeah. Um, so what you're going to focus on is your work with young people at the moment, but obviously these methods are transferable. To yeah. Absolutely. Groups. I'd say most of what I do could be transferred to other clients. Great. Okay. So um, I mentioned um, in terms of innovative approaches, one of the methods is use of pictures and images. Yeah. And you do this quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> in your work with yeah. your clients. So I'm quite a visual person, so it works <laughs> for me as well as my clients, hopefully. Right. Brilliant. So I, I was wondering if you could take us through some of your client case studies, what you've done with them, 
Um, I understand there was, uh, you were saying earlier back to me about uh, a young girl you used pictures with yeah. in contract. And yeah. And that would be so, useful if you could share that. So this set of images I use when I'm doing, uh, well, as you said, Leon, the, the contracting part and looking at what's going on for that young person at that time, where they'd like to be and how we're going to get. So that agree in the process. Yes, absolutely. Place, right? so that probably yeah. should be more specific. It's that when you're trying to agree what the whole point of working absolutely, is. Absolutely. That's it. And what we're trying to achieve together yeah. in our working relationship. Yeah. So these images, as you can see, are all sorts of different things. We've got forests, we've got streets, we've got tornadoes, tornadoes, <laughs> all sorts of different things. Um, and we've got to put on American. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, but there's all sorts of, of random ones in here, and they do look quite sort of ambiguous, I suppose. But that's almost the point because um, mm. you're trying to keep keep it very um, open at this point. And so this particular young person, um, I had them all laid out over the room and I said to her, well, we're gonna ha I'd like you to pick an image on how you feel about the decisions that you're currently facing. We talked a little bit about that already. As I said, pick one and how you're feeling. She was really reluctant at first mm. and she picked up, well, she looked at this one and she just said, well, that's just a forest. What's that got to do with me? And there was a temptation at that point to think, this isn't going to work, I'm just going to revert back to my usual way of doing things. Mm. And I thought, no, I'm going to persevere. So I gave her some ideas of uh, just a few suggestions of what other people had said, just to give her um, some, some, some sort of food for thought. So she went back to the table to have another look at them. And what she ended up coming up with was so powerful. I'll just get my notes so I can remind myself of what she said. Where are they? Here they are. So she picked three on how she was currently feeling. So we had this one, which is a dump, and she said for her it was the sense of just loads going on in her life, just too much going on in her mind. She picked this one, the traffic jam, and said that she just felt stuck and that there was no way out. And then she finally picked that one, the fire, and said that she felt that everything was going wrong. The next question I then asked her was to look back at the images and find one which was how she would like to feel, where she'd like to get to. And she picked two more, which was this one, the beach, and then this one, the rainbow. And she said that for her, they looked at like a place which was calm and where everything was sorted. Mm. So from just that few minutes, we cut through so sort of what initially looked like just reluctance of I don't really want to be here. That I suppose tip of the iceberg if you're thinking of sort of that that, um, that imagery. And actually, what we ended up with was what actually was underneath that tip of the iceberg, mm. which was this real fear of exams coming up. She talked about her anxiety. She talked about the fact she was behind in her coursework, um, and she so felt disorganised. This was all the stuff that was just completely yeah. Her. yeah. So when she picked mm. those these mm. pictures, the fire and the dump and the traffic jam, yeah. when I then unpicked yeah. what was going on for her, why she felt like those things, that was what then came out of it. Yeah. Um, so you could get a meaningful. I mean, when we're agreeing with purpose, we're often seeing so clear to say a bit about your current situation. You can get quite a rehearsal, yeah, superficial answer, and then we say where do you want to be is quite often very concrete, and yeah, specific. Absolutely. But what you obviously got quite quickly, it seems, mm. was quite insight. Into yeah, actually, it was very quick. <laughs> how she, yeah, and her situation, it, it almost acted as a catalyst for being able mm. to describe where she is now and where mm. she wants to be in a much more meaningful mm. way. I mean, for her, I was going to be seeing her again. Yeah. So I did have a little bit of that luxury of time, knowing that our next interaction, we could look at more sort of, um, tangible, you know, yeah. get into the nitty gritty of, of, of careers or college yeah. courses. But it, you know, so her action plan that we wrote together um, had things that were really meaningful to her. So we talked about how she could um, uh, become more organised, getting things ready the night before, which teachers she needed to speak to about her exam timetable, mm. how she could get up a bit earlier in the morning, different things like that, which actually I then felt what we'd got down to was her career management skills. Mm. It was things that she was identifying herself that were going to help her in her lifelong career, not just this, you know, where she was going to go after school yeah, finished. It yeah. was, what do I need to improve, <laughs> to improve my own career management mm, skills, mm. which was really powerful. Yeah. And so in, in that sort of, um, I mean, contracting stage, I think you said you 
you, I mean, quite often what we can do is say, where are you now? Where do you want to be? And then clarify what our role is yeah. in relation to it. Um, so how did you do that? And then, um, well, what I do in terms of, I mean, for me, um, that first stage of the career model, that mm. um, agreeing your, your purpose and contracting is, is totally crucial in ev every interaction mm. I have with a young person. Um, and another method, well, in fact, the method I use with, with all my careers interviews is uh, some prompt cards, which I'll show you. Um, and I have three sets, so they're just colour coded, so I have a, a I think that's first. Oh no, it's more pink, so let me just see which one's first. Right, so I have blue first. I should have done a traffic light system actually to help me, but I didn't, which was silly. But yeah, so I've got a blue set first. So basically what they have to do here is to tell me what decisions they're currently facing. Mm. So there's all sorts of things on there. We've got things like go to a sixth form, do an apprenticeship, um, plan for my future career. Um, it might be that they want to explore lots of different ideas choose between two ideas. I do include blank ones because I want it to be their voice. So if I've not included something, they are allowed to choose that one and we then just write it on. So basically they pick which ones describe their current situation. So for example, plan what I want to do when I leave school. Then we look at a second set, which is their expectation of me, of how I'm going to help them. So there's a classic one there. Tell me what to do. Give me information. Help me fill in forms. Tell me what's options best. Act as a sounding board. There's there's all sorts of there's all sorts of things in here. Now some of them you might be looking at that thinking yeah but as a career advisor you're not meant to tell them what to do. But I've done that on purpose. So things like help. yeah because lots of them do have that absolutely yeah they so do and it is it to almost gets the elephant in the room. Yes. So actually that's you yeah, know, it brings it to the table. Yeah, I mean it's funny actually because when students go through these, I it's, mm. it's I have some of them laughing at those things and, and actually picking them up and they're quite smart and they kind of go, but of course you're not going to tell me what to do. And I say yes, but it's always good to have that conversation. Yeah. And then there are other people who pick that up and genuinely believe yeah. that I am there to fix it yeah. for them. Yeah. And it gives me the opportunity to get all cards out on the table. So the, the problem point. Is, is that people get referred. I yes. Mean, and they say go and see the careers person you know she or he will tell you yeah. what to do yeah absolutely and that is what <laughs> um, they think is going to happen yeah. they're going to leave the room having applied yeah. to college knowing what job they're going to do in 10 years time yeah so unless it. that's actually dealt with in that agreement of purpose stage then actually it remains as an expectation exactly. carrying on so exactly this is a really good way of you know clarifying what you can and can't yeah. do how are you going to work with them exactly yeah. and then you have a final set which is basically what it's a very it's a broad goal, broad vision. So it's mm. not, I want to be this job, how am I going to get there? It's how do you want to feel? What do you, what do you want to achieve from our time together? Mm. So it's things like they want to feel happier or um, get a plan in place. So you can see that they're all quite broad mm. concepts. Mm. So things like feel more positive about they're the not future. Job titles. Absolutely. And I try as much as possible actually to get away from job titles. Mm. I think that can be quite restrictive. Um, it's actually their broader vision, their broader goal, and then we can look at you know mini targets, little you know, steps they need to take, mm. and that might include more you know sort of logistic, intangible things. But um, I think it helps to give them a much bigger picture. Yeah, because they might agree in the purpose stage is a danger that I mean, a, a, a sort of there's a whole thing about funnel, not tunnel, not jumping on the one job idea yeah, and absolutely. almost consolidating it before you see how much curiosity yes. there's been, how much exploration. Yeah. And quite often in career conversations, those tight job ideas shift. Mm. So you don't want in the initial goal setting stage mm. that tight goal, because it's going to close that conversation mm. down. So what you've got are more sort of broad, where do I want to be yes. in terms of I want to feel sorted, I want to decide, I want to feel more positive. Mm. Um, that's in one sense more feasible mm. as a goal. Absolutely. And I imagine what quite, quite often happens is in the recontracting later on, it might be tighter and more specific. Yes. But in this early stage, you don't want to tunnel it yeah. to me before you get that. Absolutely. And they're quite interested in those cards because the first taste you gave by the use of pictures to say, where am I now? Where am I going to get to? Mm. Will work well with visual yeah. and kinesthetic clients mm. you know, because they can sort through the pictures. Um, but obviously you end up with some, sometimes you might be on the autistic Mm. and they would be much harder for them but those problems yeah absolutely so it's about finding the ones that fit 
for you yeah. as, a, as an advisor, but also mixing it up with your, your caseload yeah. as well and, and with what would work for which client. Um, yes, yeah, so not one size fits Absolutely, all. absolutely. Oh, I mean, the one thing I do like about both of them, though, mm. is that you are absolutely involving your client from the very, very start of the interaction mm. um, they can't help but be involved uh, mm. whether they want to be or not they are involved um, and actually that's so empowering for them because they're the primary decision maker mm. they are physically choosing the card mm. choosing the picture describing how it makes them feel i'm not putting any words in their mouth i mean the interesting thing with those pictures with you know with these ones is just how different other young people or well, my clients can take them yes and i I have to really stop myself from making assumptions because I might look at an image and see it's quite a negative thing, but they can see it as a real positive thing, and that can be mm. uh, quite interesting, actually. Yeah, it's funny because when we use like the metaphor <clears throat> of the road, a roundabout, um, if somebody picks a, a picture of the roundabout, I'm leaving and think, oh, they're stuck in those circles. And I've mm. got to watch that mm. because they might actually just be taking their time. Yeah, absolutely. To see. So for you, the benefits of um, using these methods, especially. I mean, a lot of young people sent the career yes. conversations, career interviews, and you know, so you, you, it's not surprising that there's a little bit of ambivalence. Mm. So this is a way of quickly engaging them. I mean, and, and also, I think as soon as you say pick or choose, mm. it's an instruction, yeah. not a question. Yeah. And so immediately, that's gently inviting them to yeah. be more engaged. Because if you say, "Well, where do you want to be?" I don't know. Yeah. But if you say, "Pick a picture," yeah. Actually, it's harder to say. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, there was one example of a girl when we we, uh, we were talking about the way she makes decisions or in her sort of almost the way she's been going about researching. Mm. We were looking at how she had made her, um, her option choices and how she might ch choose what she's going to do after she finishes school. And we were looking at the images and she'd picked this one, this uh, roller coaster one. And she was saying that she felt really frustrated because all she was doing was going, having an idea at the bottom, researching it, researching it, researching it, getting to the top, realizing she didn't like it, going back to the bottom again, and going up and down and up and down this roller coaster. And she said what she wanted was to feel like this, like her idea was going off and you know, and it was exciting, and she finally found the thing that sort of you know sparked her interest. And she was seeing this roller coaster as a really negative thing. And I managed to sort of reframe that and say well, what she's doing was such a, uh, a useful process of researching her ideas. She was speaking to people. She was going to talk. She was reading things online. She was doing some brilliant research. It just happened that she then didn't like what she found. I said, but it's only a matter of time before she does eventually go up to the top of the roller coaster and it will then mm. eventually fly. Mm. Um, and How it was, did she respond to that? Is it well, it was quite nice because we drew it on her action plan. I did mind maps for my first mm. session. So we literally drew a roller coaster and put fireworks at the end of it. And so at the end, mm. when I saw her again, we got it back out mm. again. And I said, "How are we? you know, have you got to your fireworks yet? And she hadn't, but I was like, you know, just mm. reinforcing this message mm. that she will get there eventually. Mm. Um, keep doing what she's doing. Um, mm. So, and, you know, I, even I can sort of reference, you know, the fireworks. Um, she knows exactly what I'm talking about, mm. and that's one of the other things I like about using things that are a little bit different, a bit more um, innovative, is they're memorable. Um, you're not going to remember necessarily a, a set of question and answers, whereas when it's involved something that's a bit more interactive, um, a little bit more, you know, maybe different from what they were expecting, it's very easy for you to remember. Yeah, it. it's one of those things I think most people sort of, you know, um, it's a bit like even when we're talking here, people will probably remember the stories or the pictures. Mm. Um, it sticks. Yeah. I mean, the research into the brain is things like metaphor and pictures stick. There's a mm. stickiness to them uh, in a way that just otherwise might go in and out. Yeah. Um, so same with when you've got activities. Yes. It sticks. People remember activity-based yeah. things. I mean, with the, with, while we're talking about that, actually, the um, uh, something that really sort of stuck with a particular uh, student. Um, mm. I know. I think you talked earlier on about. The, um, or the research into uh, brain development and mm, what mm. Um, what helps us to, to, to remember things. Mm. But um, something I have tried to do as well in terms of, of metaphor um, is to visualise as well um, 
visualize where somebody is now and visualize where they want to be. And so not use picture cards. Not use picture them. cards at this point. So for, so for some of them, you know, it's about using yeah. different activities for different people. Yeah. But so so basically, this is as simple as two post-it notes. A, that one, A and B. Um, and what I've done is I've put these two sticky notes on different parts of the room. Mm -hmm. So I had A stuck in the, in the corner of the room, uh, where there was like nowhere to go, it was just the, the stuck in the corner of the, the filing cabinets. And then I had B stuck on the door. Um, this particular, I, in fact, I have these stuck in the room all the time. So if I ever just suddenly decide I want to use it, then it's there. There's no sort of planning involved. It's just there all the time. Um, and this particular student, when we were talking about his motivation towards planning what to do when he left school, mm. he was very nonchalant and, oh, I'll just wait until next year. No sense of urgency whatsoever. So I decided to use this activity and I said, OK, let's say you carry on as you are. Don't do anything, don't do any research, don't do any planning, don't go into open evenings, anything like that. Um, you'll end up at A. Okay? But let's imagine you do something different and that's an alternative path. And on that So if you've already put effort in, yeah, if you did so research, be, you absolutely did he'd, he'd So you basically have to choose. Yeah. yeah two futures of the So these are the two futures. Mm -hmm. Carry on as he is mm -hmm. or do something different. So we imagined what would happen if he did A, yeah. and I asked him to go and stand by letter A. Yeah. So he was standing in the corner of the room. I followed him into the corner of the room, and it was a bit <laughs> like this at this point. And I said, how does that feel, being stuck in the yeah. corner yeah. now? And there was this sense of, oh, mm. I, 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 must, I don't like being here. I'm, I'm stuck. I've got nothing to do. Mm. So I said, okay, okay, let's go back. So we went back to where we started. And I said, now let's go over to future B, where you have done done all this research and put lots of effort mm -hmm. in and we stood by the door and this this happens to be stuck on the door so I opened the door and said there you go there's future B how does that feel mm -hmm. and there was this I mean you could say he almost wanted to walk through the door um and he just said oh, I can't remember exactly he said something like oh I've got choices or yeah. well I don't know what, what's out there I said there we go and the funny thing is I mean it's a brilliant method because what you just described I mean people are familiar with the whole motivational interviewing Yes. Thing. No, the people need to, you can, you know, rationally you can go, okay, everybody's saying I should research and I should do this, but I'm okay. You have to feel yeah. the discomfort of the status quo. Yes, you absolutely. You have to feel it in order to become motivated. Mm. So if I go into that corner, he felt the consequences. Mm. You could do the pros and cons, what, what's good about taking action, what's not, yeah. not good about taking action. That's very, very rational. Mm. To feel that mm. you're stuck and then to feel you know, walk into a different bit of the room to engage it, yeah. and senses and to feel the openness. That is really powerful. Yeah. And what also strikes me is that's quite quick. Oh, it was like that. <laughs> so yeah, you know, people can spend ages and go, we can't motivate people, it takes ages. Yeah. yeah. But some of these methods, because you're accessing that bit of the brain that is quicker, mm. then you're, you're obviously getting deeper. Yeah. You're making some significant shifts. And another one is exceptionally quick that I think, again, gets away mm. from that um and R in and going through I mean you know how, you know we can drive ourselves crazy go through a A versus B list mm. and you know pros and cons and, and weighing things up and, and just never when trying to make a decision. Yeah mm. and you know mm. whether it's pizza you can order or what job you're gonna have, you know, and you can go it's round so and there's so many career practitioners and they all say you yeah. had to make a decision. I know <laughs> that's why they end up becoming career practitioners yeah. because they like, you appreciate how hard it is. Mm. You know absolutely making decisions is yeah and increasingly harder. Mm. But then a nice one to just sort of cut through all of that, ooh, which is better, which is, you know, which is worse, mm. is I literally have, well, it doesn't even, it can be a scrap of paper. I happen to have a little set of post-it notes on me, but, you know, it can, if you have paper, you can do this. So literally get your little bit of paper and they might be interested, so let's say they're interested in you know, being car mechanic or bricklayer. So I'd write down both options, screw them up and mm. pick a hand. Mm. And I open it up, unravel it and say, okay, how do you feel? I said, you've got to go and be a bricklayer now. And sometimes it, um, you know, you can see their joy, like, oh, great. Mm -hmm. And you go, there we go. That's obviously the one that you really want. Mm -hmm. But the opposite can happen. You can see them kind of go, hmm, I, I wish I'd got that one yeah, in another hand. Yeah, they've felt it. it. And from touching the paper and saying it out loud. Yeah. 
they get a strong visceral reaction. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, and I always say to mm. them, you know, this is a bit, it's almost a bit of fun, really. I'm not suggesting yeah. that this is now going to be the way you make yeah. your decisions, but it gets to the heart of what they want. Um, and it moves away from, oh, let's have a have a look at which is better, which is this, what grades you need for this, mm. which grades for that. Actually, how does this make you feel? Yeah. When you see that word on that piece of paper, mm. do you think, oh, that's what I want mm. to do? Oh, you do feel excited by it, do you feel intrigued mm. by it? In which case, that could be a really mm. good thing to, to then mm. go on and research further. Yeah, because there's that thing, I mean, there's a difference between... Um, uh, sort of like just a gut reaction and an informed mm. gut reaction. Yeah. So then this is where we talk about the whole brain approach, whereas it then gives them the impetus to go and research. Yeah. But also I find it quite useful to sell and that you know when they pick say they're choosing between college or apprenticeships and they pick apprenticeships and they go read them. Mm. I think describe the yes. day in the life of an apprentice for you. Now what do you know? Because that's again a dry question. Describe the day in the life of an apprenticeship for me. Take me through your day, mm. getting up in the morning morning. And if it is inaccurate, mm. instead of coming that and you go, no, I just say, well, imagine it's a little yeah. bit different. Maybe you're doing this or that. No, how does that feel? Mm. And you can use the imagination, can yeah. you, to help people become more informed as well. It doesn't all have to be dry Absolutely. information. So that exercise can be quick or it can be long, but yeah. you're using that gut reaction as part of the decision-making yeah. process. And then... You're then facilitating yes. a reflection and bringing in the research to make sure it overcomes that cognitive yeah. bias. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, they're not all of these things work. Yeah. Or it might be the one, like I have done that with one one student, and she literally said, "I, I still don't, I still don't mind. I, I love them both." And yeah. I was like, "Okay, that's fine." Yeah, but we almost that just we could then move along and, and, and yeah. try something else. And you remember um, the plant happens that too, which is what just yes. like it and see. Absolutely. <laughs> try one. Yeah, absolutely. Try one or, or the try other. both and see which yeah. one, you know. And I think yeah. you know, all the methods that I use, it's complementary to, you know, traditional question answers. I'm not saying I stand there like I have some crazy magician with all these pictures yeah, for an hour. So right from there the beginning, is, yeah. you still have the formal structure. Absolutely. And, uh, um, and yeah, so there's it's it's to complement yeah. and to make sure that you're just reaching lots of different learning styles and um, so if you had advisors now sitting and going, oh my goodness, as you said, almost you just sit there for the and bring out all these cards, mm -hmm. you know, how would you integrate this into a traditional practice? Say that and you know, a practitioner, a career practitioner, a career coach, advisor who had half an hour to forty five yeah. minutes with a client. I mean, s some of what I've described is when I've had the luxury of time and I've yeah. had two or three interventions, and that's a whole different ball game. But there are times when I do mainstream interviews and I have a 40-minute time, and that's it. I only see them once, never to be seen again. Mm. Now, I still do try to bring interaction and, and visuals into that. And probably the one I would s suggest is the most effective is, it's, again, it's, it's, it's images, but it's images of people working. So there is oh there's, there's hundreds so I mean there's just all sorts of different things as you can see there's lots of different sectors lots of different images I've just yeah there's, there's loads there have you got those from just from the web yeah just, just from the internet so yeah so you could take your own photographs yeah. if you wanted to or yeah but I yeah. um so yeah so the idea is I have them again scattered around the room. And I ask them to have a look at the images, and again, it's about so how you make them so feel. Yeah, so yeah, I'm 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 one. Them. I like getting them up and moving yeah. if I can. And the idea of it is for them to think about how the images make them feel. Mm. It's not about the job title, and I will make that very prescriptive at the start. So you're not trying to guess what they're doing. It's about how the picture makes you feel. What is going on in the picture that you like or you dislike? And what's there? Yeah. Again. So, for example, like this one at the top. No idea what those people are doing, but I might say, you know, you know, this environment is that something that you like? So, is you know, it's a bu busy, bustling office environment. Is that something that you would really like, or do you think that would be something where you, know, you don't really sit at a desk all day or whatever? Mm. Um, this person here is sitting, it's very dark outside. So it might be that actually somebody looks at that picture and says, you know what, I work really well at night. I work really well when I'm on my own and I can focus really well. So it's, I, I do give them examples myself. So I've got this that I show them first. So I've literally just got a, a happy face uh, for things I like and sad face for what I don't want. So I've done this for myself and said, look, if I was doing this activity for me, 
the things I would like is I'd like to have variety. I'd like to help people. I definitely want to be able to be creative, be my own boss and, and have the opportunity to always learn. And on this side, I don't want to be outside all the time. Don't really want to be working weekends. Don't want to be sitting at desk all day. And I don't want to be doing the same thing every day. So I have that as a prompt in case they've, in case they've stuck. Yeah. But then they just go through all of these images and they either write down a similar thing like this. I've had them write down with you know different colours and favourite colours they probably don't like. Um, and again, I give them the choice of how they how they record it, yeah. so they can then keep it as their own document. So this is a classic type of empire. Absolutely, like, it's like your self awareness and your opportunity awareness. But if you just ask them what do you like or you're interested, mm. what, you can get quite well with those mm. answers based on what somebody already knows about themselves, yes. rather than pushing the boundaries mm. of what they know about themselves. And with when you start to ask questions about particular roles or particular sectors, it's amazing how quickly it becomes, oh, like, I want to be a hairdresser or I don't want to be an accountant. Mm. It's, it, again, it's getting stuck on this on job, job title. title. And mm. what this does is it just, it allows them to, it's, the response is much more meaningful. It's, again, it's about how they feel about things mm. um, rather than it being all about that, that dreaded question. I remember myself as a teenager when, you know, people would say, so what, you, what do you want to be when you're older? Mm. I don't know, <laughs> stop pressurising me. So it's not about what yeah. job they want to be it's yeah. what do they want their working day to look like yeah. and feel like and it's funny because i don't know what i'm going to be doing in two yeah. years time yeah um, um in in the initial when i was sort of clarifying some of the key concepts i'll keep that for me when i was initially clarifying some of the key concepts i talked about not having you know not things changing mm. and long-term planning um being not having a tight goal but you can still have a vision yeah and so what you're doing here is getting a vision mm. So I don't know what job I'm going to be doing, but mm. I do have a vision. I'm very clear yes. about it. To mean, I want to do something uh, that's in learning and development. Yeah. Uh, I want to actually, you know, my vision has changed a bit. I want less people. Mm. <laughs> 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 um, and you know, um, so it's having that vision. That's what mm. we're doing, which helps them. They've got to navigate this complex career landscape. Mm. But what they've got clarity about mm. is what's important to them. Mm. And this activity you're describing seems to. Not just we heard those who have answers, answers they've already rehearsed, but by responding to prompts and pictures, you're getting yeah. a more meaningful yeah. response. And I imagine that a lot of what you're doing, it's using classic skills of just reflecting back, yeah. probing, asking them questions Absolutely. to make them. Yeah. You know, well, I will often, but sometimes they'll come out with loads themselves. Yeah. But for those who are struggling, I will just prompt them with things yeah. like, well, think about the environment. What, what, yeah. Where are they working? Is it inside, outside? Is it in a factory, in a studio, mm. in a workshop? Mm. And, you know, and then you know, look at other things that you maybe can't see on the mm. image. Uh, you know, does it look like they're doing the same tasks every day? Do you yeah. know that so you variety? Ask the same, ask the same, ask the same questions. questions. Because you're using something like that, you're accessing phone, you know. Absolutely. And they can come up with things yeah. that you wouldn't have asked them about. Yeah. Um, which is the, again the yeah. thing that's powerful, and then what I would then do with with their you know whatever they devise, yeah. they can then use that when they are then looking online mm. on a, you know some job, um, career software or whatever if they're looking at a job profile. We you know and if you are you know I'm not against matching as a um, as an activity, but I think you have to have some really meaningful um, stuff to start from. So mm. if they come up with their own self awareness activity their responses sorry mm. then when you look at a job profile we can then say okay so it says that the skills and qualities that are needed um, for this mm. job are x y and z or uh, your day on a day-to-day -day basis you would expect to be doing x y and z and we can say okay mm. let's have a look so it says that this job is based outside all the time mm. you said you don't want to be outside so, that vision then Absolutely. Gets you to, to so you can then mm. literally say do you match up to the, yeah. the jobs that we're exploring yeah. So it's that can be, and that's that again. That can be done in a, a very short career mm -hmm. interview. So it's interesting. So so far, Catherine, what you described is, is I mean, usually in, in a, um, a coaching career guidance process, is that initial stage where you're setting goals, relationship, and you've used some of those methods at the beginning to clarify their situation, agree goals, and your you know your role within it, their expectations from your role. You've then described some of the methods that you can use to go deeper, yeah, and clarify their strengths. I mean, their interests. Um, I imagine coming to the action planning stage, and you know, sometimes that can be deadly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, suddenly people revert from using 
inter interactive methods. I mean, one of the benefits you said is that you engage with the outset and you give them ownership. Yeah. And I know that some practitioners suddenly look at their watch and go, ooh, action planning. Yeah. And then they go into something that's a little bit more bad. But um, I know you also have engaging methods for. Yeah, I mean, I try to, I mean, I do um, mind maps a lot. Um, so we'll have, so coming back to the card I had at the start, so we would have, so on one side, I haven't got any mind maps, I've had to give them all back to the students, unfortunately, but on the one side, or on the left-hand side of the paper, it would be the decisions that they're currently facing, so the plan, what I'm going to do, or whatever it might be. Then on the right-hand side, we'd have the, their broad vision, so how, how, they, how they want to feel. Mm. And then literally, it's almost like drawing stepping stones. Um, and so that that's one way. Um, so those stepping stones would be the action points. Yes, absolutely. And that's and when you can look at actually yeah. what they are going to do. And what I like is when some of the action points are what they've already done to show yes. them they're halfway there. Yeah. And I know you've done things before where you've made them walk. Yeah. To sort of get a sense. Is that uh, Some coaches would be very familiar with that thing about walking down the arms to see towards your goal. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and that's actually that's where a nice and where where the images come in again because I'll if I have used these mm. then we'll leave them in the two parts of the room. Okay. So we'll have where they currently are and where they want to be, and then we'll go and stand where they want to be and kind of look back and go, okay, so what is that backwards planning? Backwards um, planning. And say, okay, so what needs to happen to get from where you're there up to here? And suddenly the videos, I might have done some of the things already. Yeah. Um, yes, because you only can say, so, okay, what would you have done? Yeah. You could reflect back if you've done some of yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, the very beginning. Yeah. Mm. I mean, even, even the, the littlest of things I think can make a difference when it comes to something like action plans is sometimes I get them to draw themselves. I mean, it could be a stick person. Yeah. You know, I always say, you're not going to be any sort of, you know, Van Gogh, just, mm. just draw yourself. Mm. And some of them just do a little stick person. Other people have really embellished portraits of themselves because it is their action plan. Mm. Um, and just something as simple as that, I think, can make a difference. Mm. Um, and sometimes even silly things like, you know, asking what colour they like, and yeah. then we'll use them the colour for, you know, their favourite colour for things they've already done or um, yeah. that sort of thing. So. Yeah, I mean, I've used um, post-it notes where, you know, each post-it, like your yes. stepping stones, each post-it note is a stepping stone. Yeah. And then they can put it in order. Yeah. So they've got a, a more interactive action plan. Yeah. They can tear things off yeah. when they've done it. I mean, it's just, I, I know because what happens is a lot of practitioners, some practitioners do these kind of things mm. anyway, uh, and then a lot of some practitioners get into a situation where they almost become a machine. In yeah. Schools, you know, and it's, well, it's hard it's to easy, remember. Yeah. It's easy to do that. You know, when you've got a day yeah. of you know, back to back yeah. eight careers interviews, you know, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's, it is difficult. And so, what would your, um, I mean, you, you yourself are, you know, working in these kind of situations. And, you know, your advice is somebody saying, this is all great, I love it, but, you know, I only get half an hour. Um, you know, well, as I said, you already said about the, some of the things that you could build into traditional practice. What would your advice be for them? Um, some of it would just be to try some. Mm -hmm. um, some will come very naturally, some you'll really enjoy, some maybe you won't, but it's about just trying them. But one of the things that I really believe as careers advisors is that we should practice what we preach. And I certainly spend a lot of my time talking to young people about um, stretching your comfort zone, um, developing yourself as a person, trying new things, taking up new opportunities, saying yes to things. You know, one of the ways of you know, progressing in life is to is to to try new things, and, and as opportunities come along, grab them with both mm. hands. And I think if I say that, and then I just revert back to doing what I've always done because it's easy, I'm not giving a the best service I can give. I think mm. I need to show that I am also doing that. Mm. And I am really honest with my students. And I will sometimes say, you know, I've not, I've never done this before. Mm. Let's just see if it works. And if it doesn't, not that, you know, don't worry about it. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll do something else. But do you mind if I just try an activity with you that I've not yeah. done before? And actually, I think they see a human side in me. Yeah. Um, and also they see that maybe this is, is not careers to be that they were expected um so yeah so it's it's uh, yeah that's actually so that's one thing i was going to ask you is how you introduce some of these methods to the young people because they're not expecting it mm. they're probably expecting to sit there quite passively while you do the talking yeah. or they do the talking how do you 
I mean, I actually think you get better in general at explaining what we're you know, offering people, so it's describing some of the techniques that we use and say, you know, how does this sound? Is something you need to do? Mm. You know, I, I think sometimes we just do things without being yeah. transparent. Um, so how do you, you know, introduce this? I mean, as you said, one of the things you do is to say, can you just try something? Yeah. Is there anything, anything else that you... Um, Sometimes I'm, I mean, again, I'll, you know, I often say things like, you, know, you don't want to just listen to me talking for an hour. Um, mm. It's really important that this is a conversation. Um, the usual sort of phrases, you know, the more you put in, the more you'll get out of it. So again, I was in the contrast and see. Yes. Saying how comfortable do you feel with something like Absolutely. Active, yeah. You know, and if they do that, yeah. they're not to. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. There are some students yeah. who, you know, I, I gauge pretty yeah. quickly that maybe they're not going to be into you know, looking at pictures or whatever. But actually, some of them will give me such valuable insight into the, what's going on in their mind anyway. I don't need to try and probe. Yeah. And actually, yeah. I'm not going to start doing all of this stuff to everybody because it's about... Yeah. Using your own judgment, which we do as careers advisors all the time, anyway. Yeah, you monitor whether something's exactly. comfortable or not Absolutely. comfortable. And so, with advisors, it's saying, well, make sure it's not your discomfort, but yes. your anxiety, be it for yeah. your clients, because they might be comfortable with this. Yeah. So, it's giving it a go with the clients, but do but being transparent about mm. it, and contacting, asking people. Yeah. You know, I often say to people, how are you visualizing mm. things? Would it be good, you know, if we try, how do you feel if we do more active things? Yeah. And it's really interesting. Oh, great! Yeah. I didn't think it was going to be like that. You know, and if you are lucky enough to have some kind mm. of um, a careers room, mm. nothing big, mm. you know, some space that you're going to be using mm. for the day, mm. if you can have a few things um, around and about, mm. I will sometimes give them the choice as well, and sort of mm. say after we've done a bit of the um, few questions at the beginning to sort of look where mm. they're at with things, and I'm starting to work out what might work, I yeah. then might say. Well, we could, I've got some images we could have a look at if you think that might help. Or we could have a look at, you know, I've got various uh, personality tests we could do if you yeah. think you'd like to understand yourself a little bit better. Or, so I will actually sometimes give them a, a choice. And nine times out of ten, they'll say, oh, can we try that? Or yeah. actually, I'd like to go onto this particular yeah. website. And I'm like, that, that's fine. Yeah. So it's all negotiated mm. and transparent, which is, you know. Um, so, I mean, that's in terms of sort of introducing it. And I imagine some people say, you know, oh, goodness, you know, my, you know, I was going to that question as I said before about adapting it to different clients. Yeah. Ooh, my adult clients would be... <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> wouldn't like it. But yeah. But what's your experience? Because you work with adult clients as well. Yeah, I think there's an inner child in all of us. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe that's partly who I am as a person. But mm -hmm. I do think adults respond really well. I mean, how often do you go to training events and the ones which where people come out buzzing are the ones where they've had the opportunity to do something interactive or do something that's almost like activity based rather than just death by PowerPoint, you know. And you know, you can see when you look around a room, you can see people starting to get excited, almost like, oh we've had a yeah. chance to sort of play, you know, but yeah. in a in a professional capacity. Yeah. yeah. So I think actually a lot can be said for using um interactive visual sort and of just activities some of the pictures and things yeah. that you, I mean I know one of the things I use quite a lot because I've worked more with adults is you know the chair work because you yeah. get people to sit in a different chair mm. so if they say I'm not assertive so you sit right let's sit in that chair yeah. that's the other assertive you tell yeah. me about that bit. Yeah. and then we sit in another chair and then this is you being assertive yeah. describe what you do and they suddenly start to occupy that sit part of differently themselves. absolutely you know, yeah. that sort of chair work or the walking backward action plan yeah. that you said you know, and they're very powerful. Mm. Create big shifts. Yeah. I mean, obviously, certain things would change. I mean, like in my cards, I've got yeah. things like, you know, stay out of trouble. <laughs> you know, which for a 14 year old student, that might be actually one of the main things they need you to do. Well, well, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But if you, you were, just change it, adapt yeah. it to your client group. You know, if you were working with somebody that's been made redundant, you know, then, you know, in their 40s, then maybe not. But what about a paid mortgage? Absolutely. Yes, you know, exactly. They, they a different set of, exactly. You would change your. Gold cards. Yeah, I mean, I have got a, a few different ones that I do yeah. do use. Um, mm. but that's my school set. But yeah, yeah again, you would just yeah. vary it depending yeah. on who your case load is. So, yeah. so Catherine, this is great because thank you very much for showing us all your methods. Yeah. Obviously, there, and I know there's more. There are, there are more <laughs> in, in my toolkit. <laughs> You have a massive yeah. toolkit, and I think the most important thing you're saying is, you know, you don't do all this all the time, but it's thinking, how does it enhance your work? You still got your structure, yeah. you still got your professional ethics. You're basically weaving this in, yeah, and doing it as you know, what's appropriate. It's not mm. one size fix fits all, yeah. But you're willing to step outside your comfort zone and give things a go, yeah. And